And we heard this morning about some of the innovations, and there was a few things that maybe some people probably didn't want to touch on, I just thought it was kind of a casual thing, maybe they didn't need to, but when Robust Details went to publication and consultation, it was the first time we saw isometric drawings for a kind of building standards approach. It was the first time we actually saw public consultation in colour, and that was one of the most frequently commented things during the consultation back to ODPM. It wasn't, yeah, robust details is a bad idea or a good idea. It was, can we have more colour publications? Can we have more isometric drawings and other things for consultation? So it did a number of other things as well beyond that. And it also has the, the largest database, most detailed database on sound installation anywhere in the world. So now you have the European and the ISO standards who regularly knock on robust details door and the UK's door to ask for our data to understand the changes that they may do in the future because the UK is one of only two countries in the world that actually asks for compulsory testing or has a database like robust details for data. So, Anyway, we're going to go into a kind of bigger role of off-site construction and what's happening in the UK, so I'm going to rattle through these um, and talk about some of the advances which are going on just now in innovation, the types of building needs over the next 20 years. Please don't panic, um, but it's something we're all thinking about, but when you kind of harness them together, it does look really quite grim at just how much we have to build over the coming years. Some of the pressure points that are happening on the technical compliance compatibility, which we heard about earlier as well, and the real growing importance of the architectural technology. It's now very much meant what I said yesterday when we were at the education meeting. Gosh, what an exciting time. What an exciting time is coming. So um, there's more to do. So off-site. Currently, just now, off-site um, is roughly about 1.25 billion in 2012, three, four years ago, that's what it was valued at. Um, but actually, it's forecast to be about 6 billion in the next couple of years. Um, and this is bringing everything of off-site. This includes off-site infrastructure for railway stations and all sorts of things like that. But generally, it's about 7% of a 90 billion sector for construction. In Scotland, we did a study for the Scottish Government. We went to visit about 17 companies, and we said, what are you doing now in off-site? Where are you going? And these were from the kind of very small off-site companies to very large ones, like your Stuart Mills and your CCG. And it's CCG, in fact, to have one of the most advanced off-site timber uh, manufacturing facilities in Europe, if not uh, the globe just now, uh, shortly followed behind by Stuart Mill as well. And separate to that, it's CCG in Glasgow who are investing, as John mentioned, in the new um, cross-laminated timber. So we went to these 17 companies and said, OK, where are you now? And as a manufacturing base just in Scotland, this is not anything to do with site. This is just a manufacturing base. It's worth $154 million to the Scottish economy. But they were saying, this is where we're going. These are the clients walking through the door. It will grow by 2018 to a quarter of a billion manufacturing sector in Scotland alone. So 260 million, so really quite exciting. And there's a whole raft of reasons why the drivers and why we're looking at this, uh, and you'll be aware of that. And I think the great thing is that we've kind of gone through that learning stage of the 60s and 70s, well, I think we, we hope we all have, of what happens with prefab, and you're not allowed to call it prefab anymore, you cannot call it off-site or other things, or advanced manufacturing. Um, but nevertheless, there's a whole series of drivers going on, and I want to touch on some of these, and also the range of off-site systems that you can have, and when we're talking about off-site just now, and later on you'll see some facts and figures that we've got of percentages of how much is being built incorporating off-site. When you say 50 or 40 or 30 percent of a sector is, is off-site, it's utilising off-site. So it could be the roofs, it could be the walls, it could be the bathroom pods, but it's growing and growing. And what you're now seeing is an integration of some of the off-site manufacturers more closely actually working together not being separate and doing their own systems, they're actually bringing different systems together. And we're seeing some of that just now through the new Construction Scotland Innovation Centre. So there's various categorizations of off-site. Um, 0, 1, 2, 3 on the left, it's kind of subcategories. Then we have 2D elements that are shown there in the blue, green, and then the far end of 3D modules in green. And this is what we used as a kind of structure where we're going to speak to many of the companies. But uh, just in Scotland alone, this is just, just a sample of the range. There's about 15 different off-site systems that we have currently north of the border. Some operate also in England and Wales. Um, and you can see a lot of them in timber frame particularly are a sort of an amalgamation of a theme, which is to absolutely maximise the envelope as much as they can. Um, they don't want to use air source heat pumps and various other things. The house builders are wanting, as we know, to maximise the envelope and use solar if they can to achieve various performance levels. And we recently worked with the Housing Ministry Showcase in Fife, which was 29 innovative new house styles using 10 different construction systems. And all the data was being benchmarked against what was designed, what was delivered. Um, and of course, everyone was preaching about their 10 different systems, understandably, before they arrived about how great they were. 
And I think what we all know now, but what we got in real detail, was the differential, that performance gap which is going on. Some of the systems were really good. They were very, very close to what was designed in terms of its envelope and its U-value. Some others weren't. And that was about three or four years ago. And since then, many of those companies have made changes and done changes to their systems. So we're seeing improvements. But some of the drivers, well, we're about 64, one, 64 million population at the moment. Um, but we're going to rise to 74 million. That is guaranteed by 2037. They're now talking about 76 million by 2037. That's a 9.5 million increase. That's roughly 4 million homes if you're 2.4 homes, or 2.4 uh, residential uh, household size per home. But 2.4 was a uh, household was a television program about 15 years ago. Or actually, our house style now is 2.1, and we're rapidly going to about 1.9 household size. So we have to build actually not 4 million homes, but 4.5 million homes. That's just new build. That's 226,000 homes per year. And that currently there are 1.8 million households on housing waiting lists in the United Kingdom. That doesn't include transfer lists, which is another discussion for half an hour. And even if we tackled it at 90,000 homes per year to tackle the 1.8 million, it's about 316,200 per year, at least. The age profile of what's going on is also changing, the dynamics of our lifetime homes and lifetime living and care homes and what we need to do. But this is the big driver. It's actually not the population change, it's the household size. And you can see over the last 20 to 30 years, the one person, two person has been the shift uh, in, in terms of the uh, number of people requiring homes. And this then places this pressure, which is that whilst your population shown in green may rise by this period, the number of households which are we requiring to actually deliver is shown in the purple line. What's happening and who's going to deliver that? Well, one might consider that that innovation will entirely be driven by house builders. Well, as we know, that's not the case. We've seen a huge change just even in the halls of residence and other things. Student accommodation right across the country, contractors and others coming in. And I think this diagram here is from the Savills and, and Glenigan data really is fascinating. On the far right is the detailed plans that have been granted. Okay, these are the ones that are most kind of up to date or being built. And that, notice the red, that's house builder. But the further you go left in this diagram, so the further you go into the more recent plans which have been submitted. In other words, the housing which is coming much later down the track. And notice how that proportion of red, which is house builder, drops away down to about 35%. That means we've moved from a kind of 83% on the far right of house builders driving this, this house delivery to about 34, 35%. And so that remaining yellow and others are investors, pension funds and others. And what they're looking for is not, well, it's when we sell two or three units, then we'll build them. They're actually wanting off-site, it's like hotels almost, how they build. They need rapid occupancy to take in the investment of what they're putting in for a 25-year period of investment on those sites. So the client, the matrix, and everything else is changing. And just when you thought we had to build enough homes, we then get into residential care. Um, we have about 18,000 care homes in the UK just now. With the requirement of our growing elderly population, with the issues of dementia and various other things, we will need to build 15,500 care homes over the next 20 years. That is guaranteed. We need to do that. And retirement homes for people of, of those uh, conditions. That's over 780 per year. And when you speak to people, if they cannot stay in their own home because we can't adapt their own home, then what they want to do is stay in the local community. And therefore, there's now an onus and a strong onus on local authorities and government and developers to consider that we should be looking at the gap sites which are in our towns and villages so we can put in the care needs and the care provision in the local community so people can stay there. Not punt them on the edge of a city somewhere in some retirement village which actually no one can access and they can't be integrated amongst their normal local community that they've lived for the last 10 or 15 years. So there's a, a kind of longer article on this in the conversation if you wish to click on that in the future. And just when you thought that was happening, schools. And so schools is also driving the off-site sector. And this is kind of seven-year itch, as we call it, which is basically the seven-year gap. Um, if the top line shows your uh, primary schools and your red line shows the secondary school demand. This is just in Scotland, for example. And what you now see is back in 2010, we kind of dipped with the number of pupils that were coming into primary schools, and now it's going up. 
And of course, the school bodies, the local authorities know this is then going to hit seven years later as they come to high school, or six years later, depending, they're going to come into the red, and they need to supply that. And so it's putting huge pressures just now in 2017, 2018, 2019 on the numbers of schools that we're going to need to provide, class sizes and other things growing. And that was Scotland and in England, what's fascinating here in terms of what they're having to do, and we've seen there's been some fantastic schools built in England through the various projects over the last few years. But uh, if you say, well, okay, how much is into war? Well, it's about 5% of your education blocks. Pre-1919 in England is 13%. And before 1966, it's 16%. So you've got about 34% of the entire education building stock in England was built pre-1966. And much of that has to be replaced. And again, off-site is being looked at to help some of these delivery mechanisms. The regulated drivers coming, which will affect innovation and advanced construction, are many. And I won't bore you, because you probably know many of these. But one of the things I would just say is the bottom one there, the EU Resource Efficiency Directive, it's coming down the line a great role for architectural technologists. So when that comes out in draft, I hope CIAT makes sure that all of the CIAT members see that draft. Because this is about resource efficiency, this is about deconstruction, this is about some of the specifications that are going to go in. So when, in 2020 or 2021, the resource efficiency directive comes out, the UK will be ready to deliver on that in construction. And we talked about energy earlier and the boundary limits of fabric. And there's been an argument north and south of the border about should we have gone to zero carbon homes or not, or should we have continued that spectrum. But interestingly, we had our own discussions at Napier about, well, actually, it's not a bad thing if we've just taken the foot off the gas for a moment about chasing to zero carbon. There may be others in the room here that may disagree. But if we have a performance gap and if we've got issues going on, let's rationalise and get that right first before we will then jump the next stage. I think the UK was right to go 2010, 2013, start the earlier projection of tightening up energy. And we were doing it way before the rest of Europe, because the regulations in Europe weren't going to kick until 2018 or 19 or 2020. So it's not a bad thing that we started so early, because we've now learned a lot. But there's still more in tightening up and learning that we need to know. And again, the architectural technologists will play a key role going forward. When we look at what's happening with U-values, and this is an example of U-value by wall thickness and percentage of wall thickness, um, these are the kind of trends as you move sort of further and further left, you move higher up in thicker walls, and we know that industry wants to go fabric first. So what's going to happen and what do we can anticipate is going to happen? Interesting to see this morning, um, the Structural Timber Association has been blogging and an article's come out, there's a report just coming out, talking about 27% of housing they anticipate to be timber by 2018, um, 2017. So our figures aren't too far out. At the moment, England's about 18% timber and about typically 70% uh, in masonry. In Scotland, it's kind of the inverse. Uh, we didn't see your World in Action program that year, 1984. We kind of carried on building timber. But also, the people that built timber in Scotland were joiners. They weren't major house builders. The people that utilized timber construction and brought it into Scotland were all joiners by background. So they understood how to treat and look after timber. And so we didn't have the same issues in 1984 as England had had, where major house builders were just adopting timber but not realizing how to utilize it and store it and look after it and treat it. But if we go to 2020, the timber systems in Scotland will certainly move up to 80%. They're rapidly moving that way just now. <coughs> Excuse me. And in England, we were anticipating 25%, but we're now seeing that TTF and others and Structural Timber Association saying they think it's going to be 27% shortly. And we're seeing people like Barrett's and others invest 3,000 timber units alone in, in two or three sites. For off-site itself, England is typically about 8%. Um, Non-off-site is about 92%. Um, but we anticipate that's going to change. And people like Rat Langer, Rurik and others, 124 million investment in a concrete off-site facility. Uh, Stuart Mill what they're doing, CCG, Oregon Timber Frame, uh, any group. There's a number of companies that are advancing in this area. And so we anticipate, certainly for off-site, we'll move in Scotland from 40% to 70% by 2020. And we may even be above that before 2020. We run and organise and work with the off-site hub in Scotland that was set up a few years ago. And its trajectory is going at an accelerated rate. Very exciting, but we want to make sure we do everything right. Uh, and there's a lot of support that we've put in, and I'd just like to thank BRE, who we worked a lot with in Scotland, um, through the BRE Innovation Park. 
But the biggest feature and feel I have just now is the whole technical compatibility. You saw some examples earlier, structure, thermal, acoustic, etc. And this is where the AT, the architectural technologist, really has an integral role because we're seeing some people now innovate who are looking at one theme. It could be just energy or fabric, and we must make sure that they are aware of all the changes that are going to happen as a result, as John and others touched on earlier. And when we supported a project recently, the Low Carbon Building Technologies Gateway, we went to government back in 2008 and said, look, there is an issue coming. You're driving all these regulations in 2010 and 2013. Industry does want to innovate and understand and improve its performance, but driving energy will hit acoustic and structure and various other things. And they said to us, well, is there industry demand for this? And industry gave us 33 letters of support, which we gave to government and said, that's what industry is saying they need in 2008 to get going. And so we set up this project, and it was really fantastic. So there was 137 energy uh, products involved, 55 in sound, 45 in structure, all of them interrelated across structure, energy, or acoustics. <coughs> it wasn't just one aspect. They came in the door with one aspect, one regulation that they were looking at, but it crisscrossed into other areas. So the critical role of the architectural technologies I've mentioned earlier, I think it's a really exciting time. BEM has been touched along. Please look out for that resource efficiency directive. And one final thought. I think the coming decade is going to be one of the most exciting for this sector and this area. And given the significant carbon footprint of our existing buildings and the required change to energy utilization and new build performance in the coming years, the AT profession could be the key drivers that deliver the transformational change which society expects of our sector and the catalysts of the future generations to inherit a better infrastructure than we did. Thank you very much.